Well, here we are at installment two of Worship Online at FBCO. Let me remind you to regularly check the church webpage for our latest information and announcements. Well, there are many things this pandemic has done to change our world, but one thing will never change. Though physically apart, we will remain together, giving our Lord the worship due His great name. So come on, let's worship together today. All right, church, let's worship together in the name of the Father. Sing it together. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit. God saves. Bow with me, please. Lord, it's a little bit strange that we're not uh, together physically, but we are spiritually together today, Lord. We've just sang, uh, we have come together to worship your name, and we certainly are together in spirit and in truth now. Lord, help us to worship you together in spirit and in truth as a body of Christ, even though we can't be together physically. Uh, put us together spiritually, praying for each other, holding each other up, and lifting up your name. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we've chosen a couple of hymns to uh, go along with our scripture today of the Good Shepherd. Uh, talks about comfort. It talks about peace. Um, 
Let me share with you the story of the next hymn we're going to sing. In the late 1800s, a successful attorney, Horatio Spafford, and his wife, Anna, and five children were living the American dream in Chicago. But in 1871, they lost their youngest son to pneumonia. And later that very same year, he lost all of his business and many real estate holdings um, in what we now call the Great Chicago Fire. Two years later, the family made plans to vacation in England where his friend, evangelist Dwight L. Moody, would be preaching that fall. Delayed due to a business trip, he sent his family on ahead. There was a terrible wreck at sea, and all four daughters went down with the ship. Anna, having survived, was rescued and made her way to Wales, where she was finally able to contact her husband by telegram. The chilling words came to Spafford, saved alone. As he was sailing to reunite with his wife, the ship's captain showed him the very spot his daughters had died. It is said he returned to his cabin and wrote the text that still brings believers hope and courage today. So let's receive some hope and courage from our good shepherd today as we sing this great hymn. Well, as you can tell, that great hymn does bring comfort 
and hope and guidance. And that's what we talk about, obviously, when we talk about the, the Good Shepherd. But the Good Shepherd brings something even better. He brings salvation. He and He alone brings salvation. And that's what this next song will share with us. The Lord is my salvation. each promise of his word. When winter fades and the spring will come, the Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know lost, when I I believe that this is the Word of God. It doesn't simply contain words about God. It is actually the Word of God. 
we're reminded in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is living and active. It is able to pierce to the division of the soul and the spirit. I believe that the Word of God is the sole authority for the Christian faith and our practice. To be able to think about this, we can actually even speak of the Baptist faith and message. It says, the Bible reveals the principle by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain the true center of the Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, The Word of God which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy God forever. This is the Word of God given to us. There are many truths in the Bible that are hard to understand and some are hard for us to accept Uh, You know, as you read through the Word of God, you come across passages and certain truths that are very inconvenient. If we could, we would change what it says to fit our human nature, but we're not allowed to. One particular inconvenient truth found in the Word of God that gives great trouble and discomfort to a lost world is the teaching that there is but one way of salvation. There aren't two ways. There aren't ten ways, but there's only one way to have your sins forgiven and for you to be on your way to heaven. There's just one way to salvation. But in America, we expect options. We want choices. We want our way to everything. Yet the Bible says there is one way. Today in our passage in John chapter 10... The Lord Jesus himself is going to give us a different slant uh, to the good shepherd metaphor. He's going to move more from a watchman who has come, as we learned last week, to gather his sheep into his fold, which the good shepherd does. But the motif is going to change over to the fact that the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, is the door of the sheep. He's not just the shepherd. He's the gate for the sheep. And this is the gate of the Lord, I believe, that is referred to in Psalm 118, which we will see later in our sermon. It is the gate which the righteous may enter. If you will recall, last week we traced through how God revealed himself to the Israelites as their shepherd. This imagery is expanded in the, in the minor and major prophets, and we see the expansion in this light. We're called the flock. We're called the sheep that belong to the shepherd. And in the exile, of course, they were scattered and God has seen himself gathering back together. But when you get a little deeper into the prophets, you find out that there's something that takes place when the people are in exile. Yes, God himself will come and gather his sheep, but he begins to speak of a branch that will actually be the one that delivers The sheep, you remember that out of Jeremiah. So God himself is going to do this. This good shepherd would also be the very seed of David, the greater son of David. This good shepherd would be righteous. This good shepherd is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you remember, the prophets reminded us that before the good shepherd comes on the scene, there would be bad shepherds who would mistreat the sheep. They would abuse And take advantage of the sheep. And this is the theme that is clearly picked up in John chapter 9. You see the religious leaders who should have known better. Who should have been anticipating Israel's Messiah. Yet here they are mistreating the sheep. And right in the midst of the mistreatment of a man born blind. Jesus reveals that he himself is the good shepherd. The connection is unmistakable. Again... He's going to use a formula of certainty. Note this, chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. I hope and trust you will read again verses 1 through 6. But for our 
sermon today, listen to verse 7 of John chapter 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Notice how Jesus starts again. He starts chapter 10, verse 1, with a double amen, 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 so let it be. It is certain, as the Lord says. And this formula of certainty should not be something that we just bounce over and forget about. Why? Because if you remember the Old Testament, prophets would say, Thus saith the Lord. They would get their instruction and they would turn and say, Thus saith the Lord. But Jesus began with this affirmation of Amen, Amen. And this is a prophetic, revelatory formula. And what Jesus is claiming is that he himself is Yahweh God. Jesus is God. Where the prophets would say, God saith, or God has said to you, saith to you, here Jesus says, Amen, Amen, and begins to speak as the one who has ultimate authority. So he identifies himself as God. So last week, in 1 through 5, we saw that the good shepherd gathers his sheep Here we see the good shepherd is the only means and entrance into eternal life. Notice how he begins. I am the door of the sheep. These I am statements in the gospel of John are vitally important. And I know that you've heard these since childhood and perhaps you memorized the seven I am statements. But in case you did not, Uh, Listen to what the Lord says in the Gospel of John in the seven I am statements. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58. Here in John 10, 7, I am the door. Here in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. Later on in John 11, 25, he will say, I am the resurrection and the life. He will say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally in John 15, 1, Jesus will teach Israel that he himself is the true vine. When Jesus used this statement, I am, this is not just using a pronoun and a verb of being, which it is, But it's more than that. He's using it in a Jewish context. Any Jew on that day, any religious leader, any disciple listening to Jesus Christ on that day would have immediately thought of Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. When Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God said to him, tell them that I am, that I am, has sent you. So Jesus is clearly again giving us an affirmation that he himself is Yahweh God. In chapter 8, when he says this, they're going to try to stone him to death. Surely, if he was not God, he would have cleared that up before they took up stones to seek to stone him. But yet, Jesus himself is claiming that he is God. But here he says, I am the door of the sheep. We have to rely on some of our extra biblical resources to teach us about shepherding or about sheep, or about gates. And Near Eastern shepherds, we know, slept in the gateway of their own sheep pens, keeping marauders out, uh, keeping the predators out, and the sheep in. They controlled what we may say in the gateway, the access to the sheep. And we realize this, but there's more to it than that. D.A. Carson reminds us, and I think rightly so, The framework of 7 through 10 is different from 1 to 5. If you read this, in 1 through 5, he's more of a watchman that is gathering his sheep together. But here, the only flock in the enclosure actually belongs to the shepherd who serves as the gate 
to those who are given entrance into the fold. So he alone has access to the pasture. We may say, well, Brother Philip, you've actually given us all of these texts of Scripture in the Old Testament to strengthen what Jesus said. And you know me well enough to know that uh, I'm thinking all the time that Jesus certainly was speaking out of prophetic understanding of the Old Testament, which he did all the time. And I think that Psalm 118 is just exactly what Jesus Christ means when he says, I am the gate. If you'll make your way to Psalm 118, I've heard that uh, our children uh, sitting on Sunday mornings are are able to pause and to look up these scriptures and to connect them to the New Testament, and I hope you are doing that at home. But notice, this is a familiar verse, Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. Well, 23 can really be translated, this is the Lord. He's the cornerstone. Well, how do we know this? Because when we get to the New Testament, how many times is this particular phrase that Jesus was the stone that was rejected that has now become the cornerstone? We see how the New Testament handles that. Well, let your eyes drift up to verse 19 of chapter 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. So I would argue that the same way stone and cornerstone is used for Jesus Christ that has been rejected would be the same way that gate is used. Jesus Christ himself is confirming what is taught in Psalm 118, and he himself is the gate. So here's the question. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is the door of salvation. So this text, I believe, now unfolds what it looks like when you have entered in through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the only means of eternal life. And let me give you four things that flow out of that entrance into eternal life and into salvation. Here's the first one, beginning in verse 8. When you enter in through the Son of God, you you avoid the enticements, in verse 8, and the ravages of false shepherds, given in verse 10. So this statement that Jesus gives, listen to this. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. And then down in verse 10, you know this verse well. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. These are the enticements of false shepherds who teach other ways or other modes. If you remember Matthew 11... When Jesus uses that incredible terminology of come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, just before that he mentions that the Pharisees had put unnecessary burdens upon their shoulders, i.e. being saved through the law or different things that were not sufficient. So these robbers and thieves were not teaching the only way of salvation which was Christ, but they were robbers, they were thieves. And so when he says all who had come before me, He's referring to false messiahs, self-appointed leaders. He's referring to false shepherds, thieves, robbers. They were God, they were, there were God-appointed leaders before, and we know these people. And I think when he says, all those who come before me, we're tempted to think, well, what about Moses? He came before me. Uh, What about Jeremiah and Isaiah the prophets? Well, I think it's important to remember that these former voices came for one reason only, and that was point their witness toward Jesus Christ. So we're excluding people that came before Jesus because when he says all, that's pretty inclusive, right? But he's speaking of thieves and robbers, false messiahs. But when we think of Moses and Jeremiah and others and Isaiah 53, of course, we know that in those times their their common thread was that they pointed to Jesus Christ. Here's one of the marks of a thief and a robber. They don't point people to Jesus Christ. Let me show you. Chapter 9, verse 22. Back up into 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, 
he was to be put out of the synagogue. So these guys are self-serving. They have motives that are impure. They move in, out, and among gullible religious people. And let me say it this way for our generation who do not know their Bibles. They move in and out of gullible religious people. Uh, We all can remember a a good many years ago when one of the movers and shakers in religious circles was actually interviewed on Larry King Live. And Larry King says to this individual, there have been many pastors that have come on my show that have actually said that Jesus is the only way to heaven. What do you say? And after this Houston quote-unquote preacher thought about that for a moment, the end result was he would not say that Jesus is the only way to salvation. So you know what I say about this Houston preacher, claim to be preacher? I say he's a heretic, he is a false shepherd, because any shepherd that doesn't say Jesus is the source and means of salvation is a false shepherd. He's a robber and a thief. Is not this statement astonishing? Listen to this. In the midst of the thieves and robbers, check this out, but the sheep did not listen to them. That's astonishing to me. Sheep, the sheep did not hear them. The sheep, of course, are God's people. The chosen ones of God that the Bible refers to as the elect. The true people of God did not listen to the false shepherds. They did not listen to the phony leaders. It's an amazing statement about God's true people. This is what I believe is a grace-given ability from the Lord God not to follow thieves and robbers. That is, you're not going to be deceived. Jesus said the true sheep did not listen to to the voice of the thieves and the robbers. I think we can conclude from this that one of the true marks of the people of God is that we are not deceived. This doesn't mean we have perfect insight into all truth. It doesn't mean that your theological grid is going to be absolutely 100% tight. We get that. We get the fact that not everybody sitting under the sound of my voice on a Sunday morning is going to necessarily agree 100% with what the pastor is saying. That's not the issue here. The issue is... Our God does put a seal of some sort on his people that they are not deceived by the lies lies of the thieves and robbers in our day. There's an interesting passage of scripture that builds my argument. It is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 and 24 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 24. Listen to the word. Then, if anyone says to you, look... Here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. Verse 24, listen. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, if possible, even who? The elect. So the implication is that it's not possible that the elect will be deceived. But if that was possible, these false messiahs and thieves would do all they could to get you to turn away from the truth. One of the marks of being one of God's sheep is that there is a genuine love for the Word of God and a genuine desire to hear the shepherd's voice, which will never be contrary to the Word of God as we have it in Genesis to Revelation. And you will want to follow your shepherd. We should be deeply concerned about the condition of churches today. It seems that we want to hear everything but what the Word of God has to say. If Jesus means what he says in this text, then God's sheep do not gullibly fall in behind thieves and robbers. It also should concern us today in our church age when the truth of God is often discounted. It should concern us when church is more about a feel-good religion, or as the great J.I. Packer once called it, hot tub religion, when it seems that that's what we want, we ought to be concerned. Do you realize that by nature, we want what we want? And if you're following what your nature wants, apart from being redeemed, 
in your fallen state, then if you're wanting to follow that nature, then I can guarantee you that you are not following Jesus Christ. The truth of God is held in contempt by our nature. There's a collision when the Word of God hits human nature in its raw form. To say that everybody in this world is seekers of truth is a mere fiction. That's not what the Bible says. Romans 3 makes it clear that there is no one who seeks God. According to Romans 1, what does the human being do? What does our nature do? We actually suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. In Romans 8, 7, we learn that the carnal mind is at enmity with God and will not submit to his law. And listen to this, because the Bible says in 8, 7, it can not do so. We did not come into this world being truth seekers. When you meet a zealous college student who says, well, I'm just here to search out the truth. Folks, unless they are being drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, they're not true truth seekers. They're seeking the truth in their own terms, which in the U.S. that means a manageable, comfortable, user-friendly truth, but they're not seeking the truth of God. So when God's people hear the enticements and see the predators, they do not follow. When you enter in by the door, you don't follow the enticements, the allurements, the predators, the false messiahs, the false teachers. You don't follow them. The second thing we see is that when you enter in through this door, you gain salvation. Listen to 9a. I am the door. If, in, if anyone enters by me, don't you love these words on the page? He will be saved. I think it's very clear that Jesus Christ is making an exclusive claim. He's not saying, I'm one among many entrances. He is not saying that I'm the front door and there are side doors and a back door entrance. He's saying, I am the sole entrance to the fold of God. He is the door. If you enter through him, listen to the text, you will be saved. I hope we all, in our climate, in our day, will gravitate toward a clear understanding of the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through me. The exclusive nature of the Christian gospel was something that used to be believed by evangelicals. Evangelical, i.e. believing in the Bible. There are many things we could list under that in years gone by. Not so much so today, but early on it was very clear that people who claimed to be evangelical believed that Jesus Christ solely was the only way to heaven. And we actually call this the exclusivity of Christ. There are the people who lived 50 years ago, I'm sure would be shocked to look at the United States today in our churches and see where we have moved away from the exclusivity of the gospel or that Jesus is the only way of salvation. People today claim to be evangelical, and yet they say that Jesus, in fact, is not the only door. Uh, but my response would be, don't call yourselves evangelical if you deny that Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. But this pluralism in our day has seeped into the way in which we view other religions. Now, if we truly believe that Jesus is solely the only way to heaven, I am the door, then we can't, view all, we can't view other religions around the world and say, well, they're just going to be fine. And it's okay to believe whatever you want to believe and just be sincere. And when it's all said and done, all paths lead to heaven. That pluralism does not stand the litmus test of the written word of God. If you will recall, in the Council of Trent in the Catholic Church, years and years ago, following Martin Luther and the Reformers, they anathematized what Protestants believed. Over 100 anathemas against people like us who believed that you're justified by grace through faith alone. We were anathematized because of that sole belief. And yet the Bible, our source of authority, the only source, says to us clearly that you can't be justified any other way other than the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. A little later in the Second Vatican Council, 
it became very clear that the Catholic Church would consistently and categorically deny the exclusive nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now think about this for a moment. You're not justified, they said, by Christ alone. You've got to add to that. It's Jesus plus other things. And then they come along, and of course, they, they talk about in Latin what the Mass means. And I don't think most Catholics even grasp this, that every time they partake of the Mass, the Catholic official Roman Catholic Church believes that a sacrifice is actually given. Now, bloodless, how be it? But they really believe that Jesus is crucified and sacrificed every single time in the Mass. Now, how can any born-again believer who adheres to the fact that Jesus Christ paid the once-for-all sacrifice for sin, Hebrews, never to be repeated, and yet believe in a ghastly sacrifice for sins that doesn't atone for anything because there's a once-for-all sacrifice that has been made. So it all goes back to, to gaining salvation and what belief is, whereas we believe it's only through Christ alone that we gain salvation, that's not true for the masses. So the Roman Catholic Church made a huge shift later in the Vatican II, and they began to affirm that there are many people with different faiths who may enter heaven as long as they're sincere. What a tragedy. We firmly reject that. We said there is one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 14.2. So this increasingly popular view is that whatever light a person has, as long as they're sincere, they're going to go to heaven. They don't have to believe in the name of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. That's what the world believes, and even some who profess to be Christians. You know, I thought about this. Does this belief really promote missions? Uh, I would submit to you that it will cut the very nerve of taking the gospel to the nations. Why in the world would Southern Baptist or any other organization want to send missionaries to someone who's already sincere in their false religion and mess up their chance of going to heaven because you stuck Jesus in there? Right? Why would we ever want to do missions if you can go to heaven just being sincere in your faith? We, we ought to just let people continue on in their ignorance. At least they're going to go to heaven, right? Well, folks, here's the deal. I believe that the issue of the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a hill that I'm worth dying on. I'm worth, it, we've got to stick a firm flag on the hill and say that Jesus Christ is the sole only way to heaven. Unless a person enters through the door and his name is Jesus Christ, he will not be saved. Are we so much more advanced than the Son of God to think that we have more insight than he did when he said what he said? In the Gospel of John, it is very clear. Salvation, being saved, is going from death to life. In God, John's Gospel, salvation is going from darkness to light. The whole imagery of John 3 and the Nicodemus encounter when Jesus says you must be born again, the whole imagery and forcefulness is that we were dead in trespasses and sin and then made alive. In order to be saved, you must be made alive. If you are alive spiritually, then you have life and thus are saved. The Bible says he that has the Son has life. If you have been saved from the wrath of God and the penalty of your sin, then you are truly saved. You've actually been saved from everlasting damnation. And hear me, folks, to be unsaved, according to the word of God, is to be condemned. Better translation, damned. To enter through me, Jesus said, is to be saved. And we use simple math at FBCO all the time when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And I know that we need to be charitable, we need to smile. And we need to be nice to everybody around and whatever they believe. But I'm telling you, folks, my charity runs out for supposed Christians who deny the exclusivity of Christ and his finished work on the cross as the sole means of salvation. My charity's over there. That's where we're going to say, no way. 
We're not going to listen to any heretical belief, no matter who it is, who says you add anything to Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Titus 3.5 says not, for it says, He saved us not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, John 3, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit of God. So you avoid the enticements and the lurement of false teaching when you enter through the true gate. You gain salvation. Thirdly, you're given the joy of walking with Jesus. Listen to 9b. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When I read that, I think about freedom. I think about security. The sheep can move in and out as they please all the time under the watchful eye of the great shepherd of the sheep. You're free to go in. You're, you're free to go out. You're free to find pasture. What comes into your mind when you think about coming in and out in pasture? Well, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, maketh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. It is there that he restores my soul. And when a person enters through Christ, they have the freedom and the security to move in and out. And the pasture I will bring to them, in essence, will be a pasture of plenty. It's a provision for the soul. This is where the sheep go to get their souls fat. The Puritans use language like that. Fat souls. In light of this, I hope we all have obese souls that feed frequently in the Lord God's pasture. This is what the Lord is offering. I want to remind you that the Christian life is not just being saved from sin. The Christian life is being saved unto something joyful. We are given the joy of walking with our good and great. And the Bible also calls him our chief shepherd. He doesn't promise us, as some say, a trouble-free life. He doesn't promise us a life free of trials and difficulties. Yet when our joy is in Jesus Christ, that joy is bigger than our trials. That joy is bigger than our troubles. God made us to enjoy Him. We are the sheep of His pasture. And if our lives are about anything other than Jesus Christ, ultimately, that thinking will steal your joy. He has to be the center of all life. It will rob you of your joy and your delight in the person of Jesus Christ. And my encouragement to you is please don't wander off to seek your own pasture or your own water. If you do, the grass will be withered and the water will be bitter. Aren't you thankful for the joy and privilege of walking with Jesus? Number four, you enjoy eternal life in its fullness. I love these words. We've addressed verse 10 at the beginning. We're going to do it again here. But Jesus said, the thief, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You enjoy eternal life in its fullness when you enter in through the door. I have, and you have often used this text to refer to the thief as who? The devil. But in the context, who is the thief? It is the false shepherds who Jesus points out in the context of John 10. They have one thing in their mind. Steal, kill, and destroy. They desire at times to pad their own lives or their own comfort. But this is given to remind us of the utter destruction that a false teacher desires on people. Steal, kill, and destroy. Please, don't take false teaching Lightly. This is why I cannot afford to let false teaching come into the church. Or when I know it's in the church, it is my responsibility as an under-shepherd, right? To guard the flock of God entrusted to me. So as long as there's false teaching out there, I'm going to be addressing what false teaching looks like. That's what a shepherd is supposed to do. So that you may not be stolen, and you may not be killed, and you may not be destroyed. Jesus then says these wonderful words. Look at the text. Life and abundance. This is an abundance of life in and through Jesus Christ. Now I want you to pause just to think about 
the life and abundance that we all have as God's saved people. We could start back in eternity past, could we not? God, by His sovereign free grace, chose you to be a partaker of His covenant of grace. Before the world was ever created, we're reminded that God chose us in Him. Ephesians 1.4, before the foundation of the world. I call that life and abundance in Jesus Christ. Think of this. In time and space, God sent forth His Son to pay the penalty for each and every one of our sins. I call that life and abundance through Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God in a sovereign moment opened your blind eyes and made you see. I call that life and abundance in Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? The blessing in the new birth that we suddenly receive when we begin to understand what our sin actually does to our lives. Before that happens, you have no understanding of the ramifications of the sinful nature. But once God gives you eyes to see and you're regenerated into the family of God, all of a sudden, whoa, sin makes a, a big difference in life. It magnifies how wonderful the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ is and that abundance that he brings into our lives. All of our sins forgiven. Life and abundance in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Jesus imputed to us so that we stand in the presence of God perfect, just like his son. Life and abundance in Jesus Christ. All of my sin and your sin, if you're saved, was imputed to Jesus Christ so that you can stand in the presence of God under no condemnation. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Life and abundance in Jesus Christ. God gives us His Spirit that indwells us and gives us holy desires and a life that pleases Christ. I call that life and abundance in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul sums it up for us marvelously in Ephesians 1, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose you in Him before the foundation of the world so that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In conclusion, I was reading a commentary called the Christ-Centered Expositional Commentary. There are dual authors for that book, and here's what they say, and I love it. They said, here's how you sum it up. Jesus is the gate. Through Him, we rest in safety of the fold and rejoice in the sweetness of the field. That's pretty good stuff. The safety of the fold and the sweetness of the field. This passage, ladies and gentlemen, teaches us clearly that there is only one way of salvation. Only one name given among men under heaven, only one way. But it also teaches the necessity for each of us to consciously believe in Jesus for our salvation. It is certainly true to say that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But I want to remind you of something. You have to consciously believe in that name in order to be saved. So both of these things are related, but they must be stated separately. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus was not joking when he said this in John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father except through me. But it also, however, is necessary to have this conscious saving faith in Jesus to have salvation. He's the only Savior of the world, and salvation through him is actually an obligation. Notice how it is given to us in Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this. You know this verse. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Do y'all hear that, folks? Uh, yes, you can and will be saved through him. I get that. But this is an obligation. He, the writer puts it in the form of an obligation. You must be born again through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only Savior of the world. You must be saved through Him. Now, I'm not asking you if you prayed a prayer. I'm not asking you if you've gone to church. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you're a part of a religious entity, whatever you may call that. And I don't call many religious gatherings a church, okay? It doesn't matter what you are part of. My question is, do you have authentic, saving faith 
in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. What you need to hear is Acts 4.12. You must be saved through that name. You have a willing and you have an able Savior. It happens one way and only one way, through personal faith in Jesus Christ the Lord. It is through His character. It is through His person. It is through His work that we are saved. And I declare to you today that there is salvation in no other. Jesus said, I am the door. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Let us pray. Father, we stand in a privileged position as your sheep to hear your voice. And Lord, we thank you for the written word of God. Lord, thank you that we can open it up and we can read what you have said. Lord, you are God You have spoken and you are not silent. You have given us all that we need that pertains to life and godliness. You've given us the complete, full uh, plan of redemption for fallen man in the pages of Holy Scripture. And we thank you so much for you revealing to us that Jesus Christ is the door. Father, thank you for salvation. It's in no other name but the name of Jesus. And as we are listening to your word and concluding and praying, Lord, if there's people under the sound of my voice that are lost and they're trusting in works, whether it be a mass or a confession or church ritual, in order to be saved, God, would you open the hearts, open their hearts, open the eyes of their understanding so that they can see with clarity that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. We pray that you would do this. For Christians, Lord, what a wonderful reminder to us during these days of the coronavirus and the difficulties we're facing with the economy and jobs to know that you are our good shepherd. That even in difficult days, we have abundance and life in Jesus Christ. The world may take many, many things away from us, but they can't take away the cornerstone. They can't take away... Jesus Christ, and our salvation. Lord, help us to shine as lights in the midst of this world. Uh, Even during difficult days, help us be champions for Christ and willingly share the gospel. And help us not look upon our situation as one that you are not in control of. Because, Father, we know you control all things. We ask for reprieve, Father. We ask you would touch our land. We ask that you would remove this virus from our land But we also know that in the midst of difficulty, that your people find their ultimate joy in the shepherd that we listen to. We hear his voice and his voice alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen.